Uh, how's your week? I hope you are all excited. There will be some relaxation of the rules. Now, one thing I realise we have gotten quite used to this uh, pandemic is the wearing of masks. Uh, most of us have gotten used to it and this is probably not to be relaxed even in the coming months. But it was not so at the beginning. You might remember that at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, particularly during the COVID uh, circuit breaker last year, last May, there was this re incident reported. A woman simply refused to put on a mask in public and then she claimed she had sovereign right. Remember, she claimed she had sovereign right. Of course, our law minister had to respond. And a few months ago, you will not miss this other lady who was taken to task for refusing to put on masks. Uh, despite repeated warnings, she also landed up in court. But just this past week, we found uh, a repeated case of the sovereign right claim. Uh, just, I think it's two days ago. This did not just happen uh, locally. In the Western world, there are, up to now, there are still a lot of resistance to masking up. And you find that the people uh, kept protesting, insisting that this is an outright infringement on their freedoms and rights. I'm not sure if you are thinking along the same line uh, that by masking up, you are infringing on your rights. I hope you are not. Now, on a personal level, on a personal level, don't we sometimes hear this said that I can do what I want as long as I don't hurt anyone? You heard this? And basically, we are telling people, you mind your own business, I mind mine. I take care of mine, you take care of your own. I do what I want, it's my right, it's my ent entitlement. Of course, today we live in a world of age, of entitlements and right. We have been tuned to the fact that uh, we must assert our right. Uh, otherwise, we will lose out. A little bit like Kiasu, uh, you must assert your right, you lose out. Otherwise, you lose out. But the question is asked, how far should we go about to maintain our rights and make such demands? Rights and freedom. How should we as believers look at it uh, in respect to the gospel of Christ? Remember in my last sermon, 1 Corinthians 8, uh, there's a reminder, exhortation that we should not do anything to stumble our brethren. We should not cause uh, our brethren to be hurt in the process of us insisting on doing a certain thing. Whether we eat or not, whether we decide to do one thing or otherwise, we must not do so freely so that it offends or stumbles our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now Paul also warns, be careful that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. This is 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 8. Now we are coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Here Paul is taking uh, the matter a little further. He's talking about rights. He's talking about uh, rights in a much wider context, the gospel context. He addresses serious issues and questions to his apostleship, the support of his ministries and ministers. He talks about the adverse impact on the gospel outreach if you insist on your rights at times. He raises issues that we must reflect on. Now, I don't know whether you realised when we read the passage just now. Up to verse 13, there were questions after question and question raised. His starting star was practically all questions. You look at the first 13. So many questions raised for our reflection. Paul was prepared to waive his right and personal freedom. 
to make sure that the gospel is not hindered. So he made them reflect on their life, on and he raised many questions that we, I think we can also reflect upon. Now we see this also quite clearly stated in verse twelve. This is one challenge that we must be prepared to take up. What is the one challenge? Uh, at times we must consider as brothers and sisters in Christ as to waive our rights and freedom. Yes, we have some rights, some freedom, but at times we must learn to waive or be prepared to waive it so that the gospel of Christ be not hindered. That's the challenge. Before I go a bit further, now, if you are reading from the King James, you find the word power. Right? Uh, the word power is used several times. The word power refers to a state of control over something or a freedom of choice. Now, as you re read this first passage, whenever you see the word power, maybe you can replace it with rights. If you read the ESV or other version, you find that they use the word right, which might be easier for you to understand. Your rights. You replace it with the word power with rights, and you may understand what Paul is talking about more. Talking about rights. And first, we have to see how Paul was very frank. He first made a defense for his gospel or for his apostleship because the people there in the, in the Corinthian church, some of them were literally questioning him, his apostleship, his rights. And then Paul had to defend his apostleship. Verse 1 and 2. We we'll look at the Paul's defense of his apostleship, and it is quite apparent that some of these Corinthian church believers did not uh, like what he uh, spoke of in chapter eight. They were quite offended. How come, as believers, we are supposed to forego our right? Did not the Lord Jesus give us freedom when we come to Him? How come we have to forego our right? So called not to stumble the other brethren. Some believers disagreed with Paul. They might have resisted by saying, I'm not going to give up my rights as Christian. Uh, I will decide what, when uh, to do this or that, to drink or not to drink, to, do, to go to a certain function or not. I will decide. And just because others are weaker, they, they are stumbled. You see, they are stumbled because they are weaker, not because you stumble them. That's their reasoning. They are immature. These believers say they are immature. They should be taught how to enjoy freedom in Christ. And these believers ask, what is there to fear in eating? Since we agree that an idol is nothing. As a result, this group of believers were drawn to somehow believe that Paul was not teaching the true freedom in Christ. Do you follow? There was this group that uh, did not agree with Paul. And Paul writes in verse 1, four questions up front. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen the Lord Jesus? Are you not my work in the Lord? Four questions asked, very up front. Paul main defenses as an apostle of Christ are in the fact that he has personally encountered the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. Who else has personally account, confronted, been confronted by the Lord or seen the Lord? Paul had, Acts chapter 9. Paul also has founded the Corinthian church. He said the Corinthian believers, a lot of them are his proof. His proof of the apostolic calling. Right? A lot of them are actually his sons in the Lord. He has begotten them. And thus, the defense of his apostleship, verse 2. So Paul defended his apostleship, verse 1 to 3. And going on, verse 4 to 12. Paul has to defend his rights. He has rights. 
but he, it's up to him whether he wants to accept or refuse the support. He has right to support. Again, look at verse 4. Have we not power, right? Substitute power with right. Have we not right to eat and to drink? Verse 4. Verse 5. Have we not power or right to lead a sister, wife, as well as others, apostles, or as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Verse 6. Or I only and Barnabas, have we not right to forbear working? Verse 7 went on to say, Who goeth before a warfare at his own charges? Who planted the vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? Who feedeth the flock and eateth not the milk of the flock? In these verses, Paul asserts two rights. The right to material support, food and drink. Paul could have told the Christian, you are supposed to support your ministers. I preach the gospel you, to you, you are supposed to give support. He has a right to food and drink. Paul also said, I have a right to bring my wife and my helper in the, mis in the mission work. That's it, verse 5. The right for fellow helpers. Paul is contending that the Christian workers also work for a living besides serving the Lord as his apostles. Now, remember, Paul was a tent maker. Uh, he is not exactly like what we say, uh, full time, that you don't have any other work to do. He was a tent maker. Although we have no mention of what Barnabas did for his living, Paul had to so-called take on a secular job, a tent maker, to earn some keeps so that he can do the work of the Lord. This is really nothing new. Today, if you look at some servant of God that are fervently, fervently serving, and yet you realize they have a secular job. They have to sustain their own living. They have to feed their families. Uh, and then they have to continue serving. In fact, they serve very sacrificially. All their time, almost 24-7, is given to do this work and to do the Lord's work. In fact, for such who work doubly hard, I say we call this who work doubly hard, we must not think little of their hard work. We must not think that they are less sacrificial because they take on the secular job. We must never think they are not uh, faithful to the calling just because they have to keep another job to support the work. Maybe it's at times, or in due time, the Lord will ask them to give up their secular job. But until that time, they, they do both. One to support the other. The question is asked, don't this servant of God have a right to Christian ministry support? Don't they have a right to be supported by the church and believers? The answers are quite obvious. But we have to ask, why is the church, or why is, or is there some churches who are not supporting their ministers? Or why are better off Christians? Some of us seated here are really better off. Why are better off believers not giving to support the servant of God? Why should God's servant suffer lack when the people whom they serve are so much well off and so much provided for. To support his arguments for support, Paul next cited three vocations. Look at verse 7. Paul cited three vocations that deserve to be paid by their employers. Verse 7. In the ESV, it says, Who serves as a soldier at his own expense. Today, if you sign up for the uh, army or the navy or the air force, do you pay on your pocket, pocket out of your own pocket? The government pay you. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Soldiers are paid by the government or whichever militia they are working for or the organization. Who plants a vineyard without being able to eat of its fruit? Who? 
every vineyard workers are paid. They also get to share in the harvest, the harvest of grapes or whatever. Vineyard workers. Now, who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Shepherds. Shepherds are also entitled to the, drink the goat's milk, the sheep's milk, as part of their sustenance. Paul cited the example of the soldiers, the vineyard workers, the shepherds. Now, as if these were not enough examples, Paul next quoted from the Old Testament. He went, went on to quote, to quote from the Old Testament because he wanted to refute his opponents in case they think that his examples were very secular. So Paul went on to cite from the point of the Old Testament. In the ESV, it reads, Do I say this merely from a human point of view? A question asked. Doesn't the law say the same thing? Law referring to the law of Moses. Huh? For it is written in the law of Moses, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Is it only about oxen that God is concerned? No, God is concerned about the worker. Uh, because he says this for us. It is written for us. When the plowman plows, they ought to be able to share in the harvest. So it's the same with God's servant. When they plow, they must be able to share of the spiritual harvest. Paul's argument is an approach, we call it approach of argument from the lesser to the greater. That's this argument from the lesser to the greater. He's saying that an oxen cannot be prevented to eat the grain, what they are trampling on. Right? It, when the oxen tramples on, you cannot stop the oxen from eating what comes along. How much more? How much more than uh, a human worker should be allowed to eat of his own fruit of labor while he, while he labor on? You cannot stop the, the human worker to, to eat of his own fruit of labor. Now, in the very clear application of this principle of support, Paul wrote further to Timothy. Paul wrote to Timothy that elders who preach and teach must be given honor. I might like to add, not just the elders to preach and teach, but those who are given the privilege, the responsibility to handle God's word, to preach and to declare God's word, they must also be given the honor. Those who stand here, whether it be your deacons or those who are given the sacred responsibility to declare God's word, they must be given that honor. Although here in the text, Paul wrote to Timothy saying, The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor. Especially for those whose work is preaching and teaching. See, Paul holds the work of preaching and teaching very high. He says, the scripture says, Do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain. <coughs> the workers deserve his wages. In summary, Paul is arguing that not only he, not only him as an apostle, but others who have uh, a privilege of serving must be given the right to be supported. And see how he further elaborates. Verse 12, uh, 11 and 12. 11. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it much if we read material things from you? Right? If we have sown spiritual things, is it too much if we read material things from you? Uh, material things referring to uh, support, right? Material support. Paul is saying that if we have benefited, benefited from a certain ministry, from a certain minister's it is not too much to expect to be supported in some ways, financially or materially. Uh, Paul is very frank. Uh, that money doesn't put him off. He, he addressed the issue of money quite upfront. This is also the purpose of church offering. When you come and give your church offering, your offering, uh, your love gift, it is meant to support the servants of God. It is meant to give uh, to the ministries, to the mission field. On a personal, personal level, I think on a personal level, when you are personally blessed, it is not too much to expect uh, some form 
of gratitude, right? Some form of gratitude, some giving back in kind. Not that the servant of God demands it. I'm saying we, the recipients of such blessing, will respond with gratitude and kind. Verse 12, if others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Verse 12, nevertheless, verse 12, we have not made use of this right. That's what Paul is saying. Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right. But we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. I like Paul when he very emphatically talk about his rights and the rights of ministers. He says, nevertheless, we have not used this power. We have not used this right. You find that ministers do not like to assert their rights in this aspect of finance or, mate or material return. They expect that the, their flock will respond as the Lord leads them. They will not use this power less uh, they should hand, in any way hinder the gospel of Christ. Like Paul, you and I have a choice. You and I have a choice to to be you and I have a choice to maintain our right or to waive it or to defer it. We have that right. The point is, whatever choice you take to maintain, to waive, or to defer it, you must ask, how does that choice impact the gospel of Christ? I hope it's clear now that Paul has a right to be supported. There's no doubt about it. Yet, we see in the next section of verses, Paul took a very different stand when it comes to the Corinthian church. Paul knew his right, but in the next section of verses, you find that he decided not to use it, not to assert his right, lest it should hinder the gospel of Christ. Look at verse uh, 13 to 18, where Paul did not receive support from the Corinthians. Even though he talked about his right, but it's clear that here he did not want to receive support from the Corinthian church. Verse 15 is a key verse there. But I have used none of these things. Neither have I written these things. That it should be so done unto me. Verse 15, Paul says he does not use his rights to support. He repeated what he had said earlier. Earlier referring to verse 12 or so. Verse 12, he says, If others be partakers of this power or right over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power. Verse 12. What, instead of not using this power, what have they done? He has indeed, instead suffered. Right? We have suffered all things. Paul rather suffer. Lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. The, but the key objective is still there, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. How we, did we know that Paul did not receive from the Corinthian church? We, we look on to the next verse. Paul in 2 Corinthians 11, 9 says, When I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my needs. Paul did not burden the Corinthians. He has already his needs from the Macedonians. So I refrain and will refrain from burdening, burdening you in any way. Paul did not receive support from the Corinthians. We go on. Verse 19 to 23. Paul deferred his right. Paul deferred his right for the sake of the gospel. 
why would Paul not insist on his rights? What was Paul's prime motivation or ultimate goal? When you look at verse 19 to 23, it explains why he deferred his rights for the sake of the gospel. Everything comes back to the same. For the sake of the gospel is the prime motivation and goal. And see also the extent he was prepared to go. Now, the next verse will see the extent of in which he was prepared to go to reach this uh, objective. Verse 19, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I may gain the more. Repeating in, uh, in 19, you find that he repeats verse 1. Paul is mindful that he's a free man. Right, verse 1, he was talking about being free. Paul is mindful that he's a free man in Christ. Yet he was prepared to be a slave again. He was prepared to be a slave again in order to win over others for the gospel's sake. And verse 20, And unto the Jews I became a Jew, that I may gain the Jews that are under the law. 21 talks about to them that are not under the law, the Gentiles. Okay? Unto the, them that are not under the law, as without the law, I, I also reach out to them that I may gain them under the law. Verse 22, he says, To the weak I became weak, that I may gain the weak. I have made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. 23, And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Paul was prepared to be a true Jew. Right? To be a true Jew to those who uh, needed Christ. He was willing if you think about it, he was willing to observe even old traditions, restrictions, if necessary, rituals and ceremonies in order to draw closer to his Jewish brethren. In order to better understand them, he was willing to become like a Jew again. Paul did not boast, go around boasting that he was a Roman citizen. Therefore, he was one up above the Jews. No. Uh, the only time Paul uh, insisted on his rights was in Acts 20, 25, verse 11. In Acts 25, verse 11, he, he came to... Uh, we, we read of Festus, the governor, trying to please the Jews. Acts chapter 25. Festus suggested that Paul be sent to Jerusalem for trial. And Paul realized that if the trial will be conducted in Jerusalem, by the Sanhedrin, you will not be impartial. His preaching, therefore, will be, and defense of the gospel will be badly affected if he was sent back to Jerusalem, going through that unfair trial. It will be hindered. Therefore, in that context, uh, in that scenario, Paul insisted on his rights and appeal to Caesar. But here in Acts, in, in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul emphasized, yes, he emphasized the law of Christ, which is true freedom and love, but he basically emphasized that the, our, uh, our ultimate aim, or his ultimate aim, was to win as many as possible to Christ. So you see in verse 22, uh, yes, 22, Paul was willing to make adjustment to accommodate others. And what an example to follow. Are you prepared to make adjustment to the people that you are trying to minister to? Paul was willing to make adjustment to accommodate others. His ultimate aim, I have become all things to all men that I may by all means save some. This speaks of selfless accommodation. <clears throat> 
we ought to be willing to set aside our personal preferences. We ought to be willing to set aside our personal preferences in order that we might open the door and the listening ears for a witness of the Lord. Paul did not deny the principles, uh, neither did he compromise in the area of immorality. Yes, he was ministering to the Corinthian church, a sinful church, the sinful environment. He did not compromise any godly principle, uh, did not deny God's principles of righteous living, but he was prepared to make some adjustment, some fair adjustment pertaining to personal ref- preferences in order that he can win some for the Lord. Verse 20 says, 23 says, I do all for the sake of the gospel so that they may, I may share in the blessings. The sharing and the giving of the gospel, the good news that God has given to us by grace alone, we give back expecting nothing in return. To Paul, this is exquisite pleasure. You no know, great pleasure to him to give back giving back without expecting return. And, th- and so far, find, you find that Paul was uh, gladly taking this stand. He defers all his rights for the sake of the gospel. We have read from verse 1 to 23. We have not read the last portion, but the last portion in verse 24 to 27 actually covers the part about Paul disciplining himself. He disciplined himself for the preaching of the gospel and how important also for believers. You and I have to learn, uh, if we talk about true discipleship, you cannot avoid the word discipline. True discipleship means discipline. Discipline in your devotion, in your giving, in your serving. Paul talks about discipline in the last passage. Now many uh, preachers have preached from this text. says that we must exercise discipline to run the race as a Christian. No doubt about that. This is very true. We must exercise discipline to run the race. But there is also another point to be noted. Discipline must be exercised for the witness of the gospel. Discipline must be exercised for the preaching of the gospel and verse 27, Paul was very much concerned about the preaching of the gospel to others. And to do that, he brought up the example of the athlete. Now, remember, remember, remember in those days, the Corinthians, they were very familiar with the Isthmian Games. The Isthmian Games were next of great importance and known besides the Olympics Games. The rigorous training of an athlete, exercising great self-control, discipline for that goal and the prize ahead of them. To compete with one utmost best, there was no secret. Everybody knows to reach that goal, you have to discipline yourself. And to discipline yourself, these athletes were willing to deny themselves of distraction, deny themselves of temporary pleasure, subject themselves to discipline. These athletes were willing to deny themselves so that they can gain top spot. Today, true athletes in the Olympics that is ongoing, you will find that everyone has a story to tell of discipline, of sacrifices, how they deny luxury, temporary, just that they can gain the priceless goal or the, the, the objective. This has a lesson for us, believers. God's children must strive for the sake of the gospel. And therefore, God's children must be prepared for discipline. Discipline so that we can uh, ensure that the gospel is Send forth without hindrance. Verse next, we can reflect 
on the idea of self-rights since we right from the beginning we talk about rights self-rights and entitlements often have to give way to training to self-discipline and perseverance for the sake of the gospel today for a christian to really excel so-called in the preaching sharing of gospel we have to face it there are competing rights within us there are competing rights there are voices that tells us you have you can you can choose to do this you can decide to do go there self rights and entitlement will compete with your discipline will compete with your desire but we must take note what is required self discipline perseverance for the sake of the gospel we've focused so much on rights and entitlements right from the beginning what rights and entitlements are you clinging on as we end maybe this could be a good reflection what rights and entitlements are you clinging on today is there one what rights and entitlements do you have difficulty waving it parting ways with Paul was prepared to wave his rights his rights to material support he was prepared to wave it for the sake of the gospel he was prepared to accommodate his lifestyle that means change his lifestyle make adjustment he was prepared to make changes to his needs and preferences so that he was able to win more souls for Christ to what extent are you prepared to waive such rights and preferences for the gospel sake is the lord speaking to you today is the lord speaking to you today that you should defer any rights entitlements any comfort is the lord speaking to you to make adjustment to your lifestyle is the lord speaking to you to make adjustment to your financial consideration is the lord speaking to you to defer some of them defer uh, it, it could come later but defer is to hang on it can come later such pleasure i spend this money now for this matter sometimes god asks us to waive it sometimes god asks to part with it sometimes god asks us to defer hang on push it aside first is the lord speaking to you to defer any rights entitlement for the sake of the gospel would you consider this challenge first 23 i do all for the sake of the gospel that i may share them in the blessing verse 23 i like to sort of end off with what our lord jesus has done for us he gave up his right to be with the father by going to the cross he gave up his rope for barely enough to clothe himself on the cross he gave up heaven's glory one or earth he has nowhere to lay his head even though the fowls of the air have nests and the foxes have dens he gave up monetary gains on earth although he owns mansions in heaven were laid with streets of gold he put his reputation at stake being born of the unwed mary he took up carpentry to help joseph and the household even though he created the world with his word he endured shame and blasphemy repeatedly even though he could call on legends of angels to strike his enemies he carried the cross to calvary even though one day every knee shall bow to him you talk about rights and entitlements jesus said if any would come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me for whoever wants to save his life will lose it 
But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Talk about rights and entitlements. He owns the entire universe and the whole creation. He owns everything. He owns you and me. Today, if we are to talk about sovereign right, remember the first slides, if we are to talk about sovereign right or personal rights, let it be first and foremost the Lord's sovereign right over you and me. Let it be the Lord's sovereign right over you and me, His redeemed one. Are you withholding or resisting His right over you? Paul understood what the gospel meant and how mankind is doomed without it. Paul would gladly forego or waive his rights, just like his master, for the sake of the gospel. And let us, therefore, learn to heed Paul's warning and plea, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we pray you continue to speak to us, uh, challenge us as we reflect upon the words uh, spoken about our own rights and entitlement, whether we are clinging on to it, whether you are speaking to us to defer, to waive, or to reject any rights for the sake of the gospel. Give us strength to obey you. In Jesus' name. Amen.